beginning of the stories and now like to uh, to kind of give, give the introductions for those who are not familiar of the issues of, of the, these uh, people, why they have to be here uh, for the last 10 years. So that the uh, beginnings. And uh, after this, I would like to, uh, after this, I would like, sorry. Um, af after this, um, I would like to, I would like you all to hear the voice of the Uyghur Asan, who's already resettled in the third countries. He wants to send a message uh, to his fathers and also to uh, the Thai authorities on what he feels when he knows his father is still detained in the immigration detention in Thailand. Uh, it's the voice will be Uyghur language, and there will be the subtitle translate into English and Thai. Okay, uh, is if ready to play now. Seven, seven, me. Ben mera teklif kılınanlar için köptüm ki rahmet Bu münasebet bilen azırak yürek ve Ruhsatsız gergenlik için samimi kaçırım sorayım ben. Onlar zulüm sebebidin vatanımızın kaçıp Türkiye'ye karab yolga çıkıp Taylandı geldi. Hiç kim öz yurdun ayrılıp musabır bulup yaşayışını kalamaydı o. Lekin riyallık onların şunda kılıçkı mecbur idi. 2014 yılı 3. ayının 14. günü ata anam ve karındaşlarım Taylandı kolga elindi. Anam ve kardeşlerim 2015 yılı Türkiye'ye uğraşkan bolsu mu? Dadam Taylat Köçmeler Kamakhanası'nda kaldı. O uyarda tutup turluğunağa 10 yıl oldu. Bu 10 yıl jaryanı da ben öz ailemini kurdum. Ballarım babası bilen köşü şüphesi erişelmedi. İnim dadamdan ayrılığında küçük bir balı idi. Mana hazır çok çok bir yigit oldu. O küçük vaxta da dadımızın kaçan köyü kaldığını soruydu. Ama hazır sormaydı. Çünkü biz onunla dadımızın ayeti onun bilen köyü kaldığını san sanaksız ettik. Bu yalğında biz neticil dağımlaştırıp geldik. Mən köyümçen bir ayal bilen toy kıldım. Biz birlikte aile kurduk. Şallık bilen tebrikleydiğin toy günü de dedem aramızda yok idi. Vettenimde durgan vaxtta dedem bana kebap kılıçını öğretkendi. 10 yıldın bu yan dedem için kebap kılıçını arzu kılgan bolsam mı? Mən bu pürsetke iyi bol almadım. 10 yıldın bu yan anam nurgun kıyınçilaklara duç gelgen bolsam mı? Bizini yalnız bakıp çoğun kıldı. Ben onun dadamın sığınğallıqını kürelayım ben. Ama ben onun yerden kürelmayım ben. Biz hemişe dadamın sığınlım tuy kılığında koyup birleşini ümit kılattık. Ama koyup birlemedi. Eksiçe onun koyup birleşi yıldın yılgı tersişip git barattı. Ailem ve etinimizden ayrılığında onlar ben bilen Türkiye'de cem buluşunu arzu kıldı. Vakti karşı ümit kılgan o cem buluş, aile ayrılış bilen ahırlaştı. Hayatımızdaki en muhim adam aramızdan yukap gitti. Biz onun kayarda ikerlikini bilimiz. Ama bağırımızda basılmayımız, körülmeyimiz, ya ki yoklayılmayımız. O ruhimizdeki en körnerlik bir cerahat köylendi. Aileler ara cem bolalma halkımız için yürekimiz bek mi ağırdı o? Biz kayıtı cem boluşunu bek mi arzu kılımız? Ama bununla sizin akıllılığınız bulmuş bulmaydı o. Bu ayrılışının ahırlışı için dadamın koyup bölüşüge asallık yaratıp bölüşünüzü sorayım ben. Şundak bulğanda biz bir aylık kişileri yeni kayıtı cem bolalayımız. 
دب تایلند مسافرلر خامخانه سی دیگه عائله سی بیلن جن بودش نی یلاردن بری تیت گزی بیلن کتوات خان غریب مسافر نم اغلب دن Uh, to communicate with the families and family feel really sad and they they inform us that um, it's really rare opportunity for them to be able to like send this message so then he, uh, he think that is very significant because for the last 10 years he was not able to send like the message to the uh, Thai authority this way so he it's Like it's it's not easy and it's quite like emotional for for him and the whole family. Uh, we happy that we are able to to be part of um, of this uh, message that we we can try to like. I think for for us and and many of us who are here and like the the speaker are here also we have tried a lot of what we can do. So uh, for the next. Brow. Now, I would like to invite uh, Kun Ratikun Jansuriya, the advisors of National Human Rights Commissions of Thailand, uh, to come with her speech. Because actually, it's, uh, after the death of two uh, Uyghur last year, uh, National Human Rights Commission of Thailand have been investigating uh, the situations of the dead and also uh, in the immigration detentions. And uh, National Human Rights Commissions of Thailand had come out with the recommendations to ask the Thai authorities to find the solutions uh, to end the Im uh, immigration detentions of uh, these uh, Uyghur populations. Uh, and then Kun uh, Kuratikun would have a couple of words and also recommendation uh, to share with us today. Yes, uh, the please, uh, the floor, please applause Kun Ratikun ka. Good evening to everyone, both uh, on site and online. And first of all, I would like to apologize for the stage of my voice. I just recovered from the cold, and I hope that I will not spread the cold to all of you today. And thank you, Kun. Uh, thank you. To, uh, thank you for the introduction of my work, and it is uh, my pleasure for me to be part of today's talk on the Uyghur refugees 10 years in the Thai detention. On behalf of the National Human Rights Commission of Thailand or the NHRCT, I would like to thank the Ford for this invitation and would like to commend the Ford for organizing this, uh, this event, which will reflect not just only the challenges but also the effective ways to redress this issue in the future. You may, know, um, you may know that in our age, migration is, is a common phenomenon. People move for several reasons. Armed conflicts and also operations are among that main factors. And people who free from people who free from danger of armed conflict and repressive policies to seek refuge in other countries are entitled to international protection in accordance with the non refoulement principle or no return to danger principle. Thailand has been providing a safe refuge for these people. However, <laughs> however, is it okay now? Maybe because of my voice. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. Uh, however, the Uyghurs who came to Thailand, as you have seen from the 
from the from the video a few minutes ago. They came to Thailand without any proper documents and were treated as the illegal immigrants and subject to detention. <coughs> Ten years may not be long for someone living happily with their families, but for some Uyghurs being detained with indefinite period and under very poor living condition has led to a great number of problems and affecting their human rights. So, what does the NHRCT do regarding this issue? Last year, the NHRCT has launched the Detention Center's Visiting Project in order to work with concerned authorities in ensuring that detainees are treated with respect for their dignity as a human being in, accord in accordance with international human standard prescribed in the ICCPR. And this project includes the visit to the immigration detention facilities under the Royal Thai Police. As the result of this visit, the NHRCT has identified challenges at the detention centers, such as overcrowding and short of staff. Moreover, there is unequal treatment among, among detainees in terms of communication with outsiders. Unlike ordinary detainees, some detainees who are Uyghur, Rohingya, and Turkish are subject to communication restriction with outsiders. This unequal treatment deprives detainees of their right to communicate with their families, combined with the lack of definite uh, release date, aggravates their fears and anxiety. In this regard, the NHRCT has made recommendations to all relevant agencies to develop concrete measures or guidelines, including a clear timeline for transferring Uyghur detainees to the third country where they will be safe. This is to ensure that the treatment of the detainees complies with the international human rights standards. Some recommendations of the NHRCT are as follows. Firstly, to safeguard our detainees' well-being, not only for the Uyghur, the healthcare system should be reformed to incorporate external medical practitioners for comprehensive care. Children, mother, and other female detainees should be detained in separate facilities. This is in accordance with the Convention on the Rights of the Child, or the CRC, and the Mandela Rules. Secondly, long-term detention usually leads to stress and despair. Having psychiatrists and psychologists on site for therapy and consultation is highly recommended. Third, allowing detainees to communicate with individuals of their trust, such as families or legal counselors, is crucial for upholding equitability and non-discriminatory in, compli in compliance with the ICCPR. In some cases, communication may be subject to the authority's supervision as necessary. Fourth, in, the, in case of the death of Muslim detainee, their relatives, the concerned embassies, the National Security Council, and the Chikun Islam office must be promptly notified. It is to the utmost important to facilitate the Muslim funeral and other arrangements according to their belief. Fifth, for a long-term and sustainable solution, the Immigration Bureau 
should expedite the construction of a new detention facility that complies with human rights principles and the Mandela rules. This measure will not only address and resolve the overcrowded conditions, but also establish a more suitable detention facility. Six, the concerned authorities should urgently find appropriate third countries or other countries of destination for Uyghur detainees. Last but not least, the concerned authority should, should expedite the implementation of the regulations on the screening of aliens who cannot be returned to their country of origin due to potential danger. This is an important mechanism to provide protection to asylum seekers, including Uyghur detainees. As screened in person should not be subject to detention. Instead, they should be allowed to stay in other more appropriate places. In conclusion, although some of our recommendations have been well received and put into action, especially on improving healthcare system of the detainees, some recommendations have not been fully implemented. The, N the NHRCT, however, never give up. We still voice our concerns and closely monitors the progress of each recommendation, especially on the screening mechanism. We will also continue to work with concerned authorities on how to utilize this mechanism for benefits of the Uyghur detainees. And as for tonight's talk, I believe that the power of your voice here in the room and also online will urge all, author all concerned authority, including international organization and third countries to seriously find the effective solution on the issue of Uyghur detainees. For the NHRCT, we stand ready to work with all sectors to find a lasting solution to this very long standing problem. Thank you so much for your attention and kopun ka. Thank you so much, Kun Ratikun Chan Surya, to uh, share your speech and also the recommendations and standpoints of the National Human Rights Commission of Thailand. It's uh, very strong, and we think that the, your, the recommendations will be uh, implemented uh, sooner rather than later. So now it's come to the discussion part. Um, and I, like what I introduced at first, that now we have the people who have been advocating, working on refugees, on international laws, on uh, um, advocate for the, the to free it or to uh, to make sure that we could have been treated according to uh, human rights and international standard. Um, the panel today, I would like to firstly introduce Kun uh, Chalida Chatajalensak. Um, the founders of People's Empowerment Foundation. Um, Kun Charida has been working on human rights for so long, long time and also advocate so hard uh, on the issues of um, Uyghur and other refugees in Thailand. Now Kun Charida is with here. Uh, please come here. And the second one I would like to uh, invite Kun Andrea Chioketa. Um, Kun Andrea is from International, International Federations for Human Rights. Uh, as I mean, I know Andrea really well, but I'm always, that's why I, I'm, I know that Andrea has been in the Legion for a long, long time, and he's been advocating for human rights for a long time, too. Um, so then, like, 
I don't care much about his organization anymore. <laughs> so that's why I'm sorry that I like. Uh, yeah, so uh, he's uh, re responsible on like the this region decks uh, according to the FIDH. Um, and Hun Phil Robertson also from Human Rights Watch. Again, I think, I think most of you who work on the human rights in Thailand and in these regions, I think everyone knows Phil Robertson who's been in the region for so long. And uh, Kun Kanui is on the way. He, um, he traveling from Don Muang Airport to here, and uh, we wish that he will be here. He will be here in like in 15 minutes or something. But yes, <laughs> but yes, um, but okay. Let let's start from what we have at the moment. Um, and actually, yes, yeah, since I already saying that you have been working on the issues related to uh, refugees, Uyghurs, human rights in Thailand, situations of detentions, uh, the prisons or immigration or whatever. So I would like to start from um, Andrea, like on this that you can, and also I heard from uh, people feedback that they might not know much about like what's going, what happened why these Uyghur people have to be here in Thailand. We show video in brief, but might be good if you can talk a little bit on like why they are here and, and what reason why they cannot move further. Yeah, but yeah, and you, right. yeah, and you can go for it. But I mean, yeah, it can be relaxed no? because you know each other really well, so then you can jump between whatever like you feel yeah, comfortable, but Andrea. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Is this working? Can you hear it? No? Yeah, use that one. All right, there you go. Let's try with this one. Perfect. Good evening, everybody, uh, those in the room and those tuning in from uh, the internet. Um, my name is Andrea Giorgetta. Uh, I'm the Asia Desk Director for International Federation for Human Rights, or FIDH. Um, I think as Kune just mentioned it's important to perhaps take a step back and provide a brief context of the situation of the Uyghurs in Thailand. Um, because for over a decade, Thailand has been uh, one of the primary transit states uh, for Uyghurs uh, who fled persecution and very serious human rights violations back home in the Chinese region of Xinjiang. Um, so Around 2013 and 2014, it estimated that around 500 Uyghurs uh, fled uh, to Thailand uh, to seek asylum and to um, await, in many cases, relocation or resettlement to a third country. And um, those who arrived in Thailand were normally arrested by Thai authorities without being afforded um, sufficient uh, due process um, uh, recourse, and uh, in most cases they would end up in immigration detention center, as it's been mentioned, um, without uh, any lack of effective uh, protection mechanisms, and particularly without um, the possibility of any judicial review of their detention. Um, in many cases, in fact, and I think Kunratikun already hinted uh, to, to that, uh, Uyghurs uh, detained in Thailand have been subjected to deportation uh, back to China. Uh, this is obviously um, a blatant violation of uh, the international human rights law principle of non refoulement which means that uh, people who are at risk of uh, being tortured or subjected to other ill treatment or any irreparable harm in, uh, back in their home country shouldn't be returned there. Um, also in violation of Thailand's obligation under the Convention Against Torture, to which Thailand is a state party. Um, again, I think Phil and Chalida will speak to this issue in greater detail, but it's important to mention it that, that this has happened. So some Uyghurs are still here, but many have been sent back uh, into harm's way in, in China. Um, it is estimated that um, there are around 50 Uyghurs that are now um, mostly in detained in immigration detention centers across Thailand and a smaller number um, in prisons across Thailand. 
Um, those who are in immigration detention centers, I think it's been mentioned by, by Kunrati Kun in the opening remarks, uh, have been subjected to, um, to a treatment that is seriously uh, inadequate and inhumane. Um, some elements have been already mentioned, uh, severe levels of overcrowding, poor ventilation, insufficient food, um, lack of access to medical care, um, and any other basic necessities, um, restrictions on communications with the outside world and communications with their family and relatives, and more generally, violations uh, of their basic human rights. Um, in prisons, the situation is a bit different, but the challenge here is that uh, we don't really have uh, much information about how many Uyghurs are in prisons across Thailand. According to the Department of Corrections, um, as of December last year, there were 295 Chinese nationals in prisons across Thailand, but since there is no breakdown by ethnicity, we simply don't know how many of them are Uyghurs. We know that a handful of them um, have been sentenced to prison terms for um, attempting to escape uh, an immigration detention center in the Northeast a few years ago. And then there is a case of uh, two Uyghurs. Um, their names are Bilal Mohammed and Yusuf Mirali. And I think I would like to focus a little bit more on this specific case a bit later. But, but for now, I think uh, I'll end it here and turn it over to my colleagues. Thank you. OK, yeah, um, I think that is good introductions. And then I think it's turn to, uh, since um, Andrea mentions about fields, like, like few, can you also say that why why they, they have to be detained and why like they can't go nowhere. It's already 10 years. But before that, actually, it's a very good timing because yesterday the Bangkok Post just published an article written by uh, Elaine Pearson. She's the uh, Asia Director of Human Rights Watch. Uh, it's on the situations. And then for its good introductions, if you are interested to know also because it's about like why they come here and, and how many have been sent back and what have happened to them now. And also this one, that is the Thai versions at the Himalayan Watch websites. Uh, you can read like both uh, in, uh, English versions online uh, here in Bangkok Post and also Thai versions at the Himalayan Watch uh, website. We, we can share uh, uh, the link to the website. But yeah, feel, yeah, why? Why can't they go nowhere and yeah, what? Okay. Um, well, I mean, it's important to understand some of the history here uh, about how did the Uyghurs come to Thailand. <clears throat> and without going into too much detail, what we can say is around 2013 or so, Uyghurs were already leaving Xinjiang. All right? Uh, and they were coming out of Xinjiang, they were going down through Yunnan and into the Mekong countries. The idea is that they were trying to get to the southern border in Thailand, get across the border into Malaysia, and then ideally be able to go from Malaysia to another country, ideally Turkey. Okay, so that was the route. And in fact, that route was also a similar route that was being used at that time by the Rohingya who were coming through there. So I mean, actually the people at the, the southern border were some of the same gangs that were doing this work, okay? Um, <clears throat> what we had was uh, the groups of people coming across, going down there, and um, looking back to March 2014, March 1st, 2014, there was a attack uh, in the Kunming Yunnan rail station, okay? Uh, that happened uh, with eight Uyghurs who were attacking uh, and, let's see, eight sword and knife wielding Uyghur terrorists, basically. They were terrorists. They're attacking passengers at the main railway station in Kunming. They killed 31 people. Uh, they wounded another 143 people. Um, and they did that with knives and swords. So you can imagine what that was like, all right? Um, four of them were killed uh, by police at the attack. One was captured and another three were captured later. What that did was create a massive shock to the Chinese state security apparatus. All of a sudden they realized that they had these Uyghurs who were coming through Yunnan and leaving the country and there was this attack that took place. And quite quickly also, China started putting pressure on Thailand 
to stop these movements. And that's why we started having arrests at the border. <clears throat> um, we can go into the actual details of it, but um, just about 10 years ago, uh, actually on March 13th, uh, 2014, we had a group of immigration commanders from the Sadao, IDC, and Songkhla. Uh, and they went up the mountain uh, to patrol. I think they were expecting to find Rohingya. Um, they went up in the late afternoon. And trailing along behind them were several Thai TV camera crews. And they got into the jungle. They were several kilometers from the Malaysian border. And they stumbled onto another totally different group of people, totaling 220 women, men, and children. Uh, the women were all clad head to toe in burqas. None of the people would talk to the immigration officers except for one or two of the men who were considered to be spokespersons for the groups. And interestingly, they were carrying considerable amounts of money and jewelry, which of course immediately differentiated them from the Rohingya because the Rohingya were largely, largely impoverished and had nothing. Um, and what happened was, as the cameras rolled, you know, they showed them trying to interrogate these people in the jungle. None of them were talking. Um, the immigration officer were getting frustrated and finally, they said, well, hell with it. Let's just take them back to the IDC and sit out. And the spokespersons were claiming that you know, we're, we're all Turkish nationals. And we're on our way to Turkey. We're going home. You have no right to detain us. And the immigration commander, interestingly, um, who was still a little bit stumped about who these people were, he made some calls to contacts at UNHCR and to IOM. And, and both those agencies immediately suspected what they had on, in hand here. And they both urged him informally, Jesus, just let them go. If you don't let them go, you're going to have them forever. And that is exactly what has happened. The, the, the Thai immigration commander, he balked. He didn't, he didn't let them go. And with his hesitation, the opportunity to end this whole saga right then and there was lost. What we have seen, and we can go into the, the, the details of this, but the reason that these, these uh, at least 50 people are frozen in there is that there, is a, uh, there are two competing poles of influence. On one hand, you have China saying that they must all be sent back to China. And a lot of the international community, the UNHCR and others, all oppose that. Um, on the other side, you have the United States, backed by the European Union, Canada, the other like-minded countries, saying, in fact, these people should be considered as refugees, they should be allowed to go, be let go, and they should be allowed to go and reunite with their families. Um, <clears throat> what we saw was, the, after this 220 was arrested, then there was a further crackdown. So uh, there was a number of, of smaller groups of Uyghurs who were coming across Cambodia and got arrested at the Cambodian border. There was one group actually the Cambodians arrested inside Cambodia, I think it was like Siem Reap or Batambang, and they just basically took them to the border and pushed them over the border and said, go to the Thais, you take care of it. So the overall number swelled to at least 300, probably over 300. And there was a big fight because the, the Uyghurs were saying, we're not Uyghurs, we're not from China, we're, we're Turks. And, and China was trying to get access to them claiming that these were Uyghurs, but they wouldn't admit that. And at the same time, UNHCR was not part of the picture because the, the, the Uyghurs didn't want to talk to UNHCR. Because if you talk to UNHCR, what that means is that you're considered to be from China. And so there was a big fight between China and Turkey over whose nationals these people are. Um, and ultimately, uh, <clears throat> what happened was, this was fought out at the immigration, it ended up in the court. Um, Turkey asserted that they were all Turkish nationals and issued documents to that effect. Those documents were not accepted by the Thai court. Uh, and uh, if, if Natalie Bergman was here, she could talk about that whole case, because she was, I think, the lawyer on it. But 
what ultimately happened was Thailand pressure between the two sides made a very bad decision. And their bad decision was to try to compromise between sides and they basically pursued a strategy that I would call uh, cutting the baby in half. <laughs> because uh, on July 1st, 2015, they sent 173 women and children to Turkey. And everybody said, that's great, that's wonderful, thank you so much. Then a week later on July 8th, the Chinese government sent a plane with the People's Armed Police on board and Thailand handed over 109 men and boys who were handcuffed, they were blindfolded, and they were frog marched onto that plane. You can, you can find the video of that online. You know, it's very chilling. You have these blindfolded, handcuffed Uyghurs sitting in these seats, each with a armed people's armed police person next to them, flying off to China. And they, the 109 were flown back to China. They've never been seen or heard from again. You know, and that resulted in a ferocious backlash. UNHCR, UN Secretary General, uh, all the various different governments, US, EU, others, all criticized Thailand. And Thailand was like, well, what do you want? We sent half of them over here, we sent half of them over there, you know? You know. And, and, and this, was, this was, be clear, this was NCPO government. This was Prayut and Prawit. They had a lot of favors that they had to pay to China because they were trying to use China to pressure the Europeans and the Americans to be nice to them. You know, they were basically trying to get close to the Chinese to make the Americans jealous. Um, and so when that happened, the next day there was an attack on the Thai cons honorary consulate in Istanbul, uh, which was plundered, it was destroyed. And then uh, a month later, on August 17th, we had the bombing at the Erwan Shrine. And that killed 20 people, it injured another 125. I'm sure we'll hear more about this from Kunchalita and others. Uh, but the Thai police and the authorities believe that that bomb occurred because they sent the Uyghurs back to China. So in the middle of all this, when you have these two competing diplomatic groups, you have the Chinese on one side and you have the US and friends on the other side, Thailand has decided the best decision is no decision. And so what they're doing is they're letting these Uyghurs rot in detention. Two of them died in 2023. I'm sure that if they, if they were speaking frankly, they'd say, well, if they all died, it didn't matter because then the problem would be solved. But they are not prepared to do anything. They just let them rot there. And we have been trying to advocate for them to be let go and go to, to Turkey or wherever they want to go. Um, and I'm sure the Chinese are, are busy advocating every day. You can't let them go. You have to send them to us. And so that's, you ask why is it stuck? That's why it's stuck. That's, that's really good and, and it's really, really clear and you uh, um, give the information on like different anchors like what had happened uh, in China and then its effect to like the people here in Thailand. Yeah, I, I want to sh uh, show here again uh, for those who are online, uh, watch it online if you want to reach the articles uh, on the Bangkok Post uh, and you can, you can get it online also. Um, so then, I think I, I have questions for both of you, but I would like to go, before I go to P. Chalida, now Kun uh, Kanavi Sub Sang, the, uh, move for, uh, the uh, member of parliament from, from Fair Parties, <laughs> uh, is already here. Uh, like, welcome Kun Kanavi to be on, on the seat, and I think he may need to take a breath a little bit, so then I, I will not let him talk for now, but um, I, I will go to uh, P. Kun Chalida, P. Chalida, and because uh, I understand Kun Chalida have been advocate, advocating and also monitoring the situation of Uyghur in detention uh, since in the beginning. So, I mean, from Thailand and in the perspective of like local Thai, what can we do? Do we, can, can we do anything to, to make the situation better? Can you share with us and any obstacle that you are facing and anything that you need support from any parties that can be helpful? Yeah, please tell you that. Yeah, thank you. First of all, I thank you for Fortify Rice that organized this kind of the discussion to make. And uh, I'm a little bit surprised that there are so many people uh, that interest on the Uyghur issue. 
because it looks like it's an invisible issue in Thailand, but right now I can see that many people are interested on this issue, and thank you so much for uh, to organize this. Now. First of all, I would like to answer your question, why we go come here? Why we not living in, in China? Uh, Uyghur is a Muslim, uh, they are the Muslim, no? And uh, China is no religions, I can say that, because they are the communist ideologies. The Uyghur case is similar with Tibetan, that they are, uh, Chris, uh, they are Buddhist and they are under the pressure of China. Uh, the same with the Uyghur, and, uh, but in the case of the Uyghur, they also would like to take over the land of the Xinjiang and they send the Han people, the Ch Chinese people, to living also in the Xinjiang. And they also try to uh, do many human rights violations uh, for the uh, Uyghur people. For example, don't allow them to go to the mosque and to pray in the mosque. Uh, that, is, that is something that against with the principle of the Muslim uh, religions now, so that why uh, that is just only a few uh, sample that I give it to you. But as a Muslim, if there's some country that not respect the uh, practice of the religion, is very difficult for them to live in, in in under that circumstance. So that why they leave that Xinjiang and try to move to another countries uh, to that accepted and also respect the Muslim. Uh, religions to live under the uh, Muslim communities to for them to practice their own uh, religious practice. So why they wouldn't want to go to Malaysia, and then uh, from Malaysia they also plan to go to another third countries that as a Muslim country that will accept them. But however, they stuck here for more than ten years. Uh, that is the first one. The second point that I would like to say is also about the, the relationship between Thailand and China. You also know that China, a uh, few also mentioned some things now, but however, China and Thailand religion, uh, li a relationship is the most uh, set, uh, important right now. You also can see the policy of uh, this government. Kuncheta is also open. Uh, free visa for China to come. And they also hope that the uh, economic of Thailand is will be increased and also will get well, better from the tourists from China and also the investment of the China. So that why they must be good with the chi chi China. But however, when you compare with China and, and Uyghur, Uyghur is so small and have nothing when compared with the China as a superpower. And the Chinese is also monitor the case of Uyghur in Thailand very closely that we also know now. Uh, maybe few also also know that uh, during that time, Kun uh, Kandawi also do a lot of advocacy at that time. Uh, but however, China, I got the information from MOFA, uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs Thailand, that they say that China sent information to Ministry of Foreign Affairs every day on the case of the Uyghur and they have a thick uh, document. But however, when compared with the Tur Turkey you know, uh, government, they are not, not similar. You know, Turkey said that they also sent the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to meet and talk with the Thai uh, <coughs> Ministry of Foreign Affairs already. They would like to receive all of them to uh, settle in, in uh, Turkey. You know. Kun Kandawi can, can uh, say more something about this, but because of the relationship of China, so that's why they cannot send to Turkey. Uh, for the, this case, uh, Thai, you also know that from last, last government, Kun Prawit also have very good relationship with China. And then uh, the, the, and he take care with the case of Uyghur because he's a, uh, Deputy Prime Minister who take care with security issue in Thailand. And for Uyghur, is considered as a top secret security issue in Thailand. Why? Because of relationship with China. And that's why decision should come, to come from Kun Prawit, you know, because Prawit take care with this issue. And you can, can, can, can imagine how, how that Prawit can make decision because he is very good friend with China. And what, who is Uyghur is a, like a small 
small small group of the people who is not nothing no in in his perspective so when uh, uh, under the pressure of the international so uh, they cannot send the uh, Uyghur to China but however 109 was forced to send back to China <clears throat> and after that there are a lot of campaign and also pressure to Thailand not send any more Uyghur to back to China because they were faced with the big human rights violation. We know that all of them was killed, were killed already and died because we follow up with National Security Council. At that time, Kim Tho Win is a, a Secretary General and then we also talk with him, that, are you sure that all of them is safe in China? And they say, oh, this is a video. Uh, they visit and then uh, they show the video to us and we say, are you sure that the video that you see, it is the real Uyghur 109? How did you know this is 109 people <coughs> that <coughs> were sent back to China and he cannot answer? Because they closed the face, no, with the black backpack. And then the name, we also don't know the real name of the Uyghur, you know, in detention center. So when he cannot answer and then we say that, I'm not so sure that the information that you got from China at that time is correct for us. We think that all of that uh, maybe passed away already because they will not keep, China will not keep this kind of the people that they consider them as a terrorist and also uh, dangerous for their own country. And uh, after they sent back for nine, nine, 109 back and then it remained 50 Uyghur in detention center and then after that in uh, 18 of August, there will be the bomb at Erawan Chai. And then they link this bomb to the 109 that sent back to China, that it will be maybe the Uyghur make this bomb. But however, so that why two Uyghur that been, uh, were arrested and now is in the, in under the trial, cause trial, uh, last month and next month again, what, what day, 23, March? Uh, 23 to 20, 22 to 23 March, it will be the next trial of the two Uyghur who had to the, do the bomb, case of the bomb in Erawan Chai. I, I would like to invite all of you to, op, to op, uh, observe the trial in the court, and then you can see that, I don't know, when I listen, I think that he didn't do, he didn't do the commit with that crime or the bomb, you know. The, the evidence that is uh, sharing in the court, I think that there are many things that you, it is not a good uh, evidence to, to uh, make them uh, to be the sentence, not to, be, uh, to, to go to the sentence. I think that they are, they are innocent people, but however, it's more than 140 witnesses to be trial and maybe it's been take one year or two years to end of these cases. But however, the court is very sympathy with the case because he said that the, the high, uh, the high, uh, the, the judge, the high judge also said that this case is very long, more than 10 years already, nearly 10 years. So it's possible to cut the witness and make it quickly to, uh, to make this uh, decision and also do the sentence for this case, but however, cut the the witness from 700 to 140. <laughs> it's been take more than two years now. So you can can you imagine? We don't know that they've been do wrong or not wrong or, or innocent, but however, it's very long process uh, for this case now. And uh, we can see two of them in the court. Milan is, uh, they also complain, the Yusuf and Milan also complain that the, the food that they, the military give it to them is not halal and they cannot eat. Milan said that they cannot eat, they eat and then they swamp out because they know that it is pork or something <coughs> and then they cannot eat. The Muslim will not eat any blood, right? And they put, yeah, so they put in the curry with the blood of, uh, chicken or something like that and they cannot eat and they complain in the court and they when they, they cannot eat so they are very thin they lose the weight more than 10 kilos 10 or 15 kilos so Milan cannot walk now but now we also try to to keep food uh, 
good food, halal food to them when they are in the court, no? because we also ask permission from the court for us to give uh, good halal food to them at least two or three days in the court. Uh, they should have a good food to eat. No? And then first, first they say that no, the prison should bring the food from the, to, from the prison to the, to the court. And we said, that is not halal. And usually you can see what happened with Bilan. No? And then now the court is very simply, so they allow us to. We have a chance to give them uh, the good food. But however, 10 years in the court, in the prison, not only the two of them in the uh, military Rapsip 8, no? they are in the Rapsip 8 military camp. And then uh, right now they have 43 in detention center and five in the complaint prison. No? You can see that uh, 10 years in the prison, the hell is when we have problem. It's impossible. We are living outside the, the, the, the prison. We also get sick, you know, for 10 years. But now they are living in the prison, in the detention center, 10 years. What happened with their health? Many of them have bad, very bad condition of the health. We, People Empowerment Foundation, donate some money for operation and also uh, to, for the case of the Uyghur or in detention center, in the prison, and also in the Rapsipet no, for them to have operation to go to see the doctor. So now more and more money you know, to support them because more than 10 years, not good food, not good condition of living, everything make people sick and very sick. And you, we also have some case, some sample that uh, five of them in detention center is also dying you know, because of the bad condition. Mm -hmm. So this are of the thing that uh, happened with the Uyghur in Thailand. They cannot meet with UNSCR because of the top secret uh, security issue. They cannot get any, we cannot visit them, you know, in IDC because of the top secret issue. Uh, when there are something happen with them, we call to the authority, they will not give us information. So this kind of the situation of the Uyghur in Thailand. I would like to say that in last few days, you know, two of them escaped from IDC and two was arrested already, were arrested already. They will bring to the court uh, for trial and may be sent to the prison. This is to show that they will fight every way to escape from the detention center or prison because they need freedom. Why did you, a Thai government put them in that, in that, in prison, you see? This is not the place to give, to put them there because when we met with the uh, Foreign Affairs Committee in the parliament, we also raised many issues there. And then they also said that they're, why you put them there for 10 years already? It is not the place because the detention center is a place to keep for short term for people to live there and send to the third country. But they say that because uh, this, this group of the people cannot resettle in the third country because of China. China always check how, how many of them, where they are, how the Thai government treat them. And then if they want, would to send uh, this group to the third country, it should, China should be approved and also agree uh, to agree to send them to the third country. I remember that one of the Thai MP also asked why we must be follow China. We are not independent anymore. We are part of China. Why we must be follow and also listen to China all the time. And, and uh, one of the officers, I don't want to mention the, the de uh, department, one of the officers also mentioned that because we need good uh, relationship with China and also good economic support by, by China. So we will uh, let these people continue with suffering in the country, change with the good economic of the countries. That is the answer that they give it to us. And um, Piti, you I want to? Do you want to stop now and come for the second round, or you, you want to finish the second meeting? round? Okay, ah, second okay, round, maybe. Yeah, yeah, okay. I want to listen to the other. Ah, okay. okay. Uh, Thank you so much.
before I turn to Kun Ganawina for the role as an MP, but uh, because since Piti mentioned a couple of things interesting, like I think what Piti is saying is not only about the situation of Uyghur in immigration detentions, but also the case of uh, the Elevan tribe. So um, uh, again, these two incidents are different because those who are in immigration detentions, they, they, they try to run away and they want to get resettled. So actually there is no criminal charge or nothing to, against them. But for everyone tried, bombing is also interesting when uh, Pichirida mentioning about like several hundred witnesses, which is, is, is impossible and now is again is 10 years the same time. It's, I mean, the, if we want to call for justice, this is like a delay. It's kind of the delay tactic in order to get justice also. So this is seem to be the another like scenarios uh, that happen to the Uyghur, even they uh, they are uh, what they call the defendants of the, uh, the the crime. But actually, the justice have to come early. It cannot be like like this that they have to wait for so long. Um, but uh, Pichirida also mentions like situations in the in, uh, the prisons and other things and the way that they have been detained in both cases for for long time. I would like to hear in terms of international standard like and and also for Andrea like you you have been monitoring the the prison conditions and like the court trials and other things. Do you have any um, any uh, observation that you have seen, like situation of prison here in Thailand, or Im immigration, or the trial, on the cases like this? So I don't know. Do you want to, like, according to international standard, or do you see anything like something that like missing for, for Thailand on specific to treatment of the Uyghurs deten in detention or in the prisons, or a few? If you want to like add on, but yeah, we don't want to. No, well, I, I keep him later, no worry. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, yeah. j just briefly, um, uh, what we can say with absolute certainty is that, that um, the indefinite detention of Uyghurs uh, and perhaps others, but, but, but for now we can focus on the issue of Uyghurs, the indefinite detention of Uyghurs in uh, immigration detention centers is definitely in contravention with international law and standards. So um, the arbitrary detention um, is, a, is a principle of uh, international law, of customary international law that must not be violated by any uh, uh, government or country. And so um, when we say arbitrary detention, um, there, are, there are certain categories that, that, for instance, the United Nations, and in particular the United Nations Working Group on Arbitrary Detention, um, helps define what uh, arbitrary detention is. Um, one of these specific categories is, in fact, related to uh, migrant, refugees, and immigrants. Uh, and um, the prolonged uh, administrative custody uh, of those categories of individuals uh, is certainly falling under the definition of arbitrary detention. And so again, uh, the prohibition of arbitrary detention is under Article 9 of the International Covenant for Civil and Political Rights. Again, it's a norm of customary law, even if Thailand had not signed and ratified the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the ICCPR, this norm would apply to uh, the treatment of Uyghurs or any uh, other individual uh, deprived of, of his or her own liberty. And so again, um, Thailand is, has in fact uh, ratified this convention, the ICCPR, so it is, it is bound by, by the provisions. Uh, so in fact, uh, if we were to make submissions to this UN body, the UN Working Group on Arbitrary Detention, on all the cases of the Uyghurs, you would have the Working Group on Arbitrary Detention telling the government of Thailand that all those cases amount to an arbitrary deprivation of liberty. They would call on the Thai government to release uh, those, those detainees and, and in fact provide them with reparation for the deprivation of liberty they have suffered. Yeah, I was just going to say that <clears throat> in addition, uh, it's quite clear that if in fact this group of people were sent back to China, uh, they would be definitely probably subject to torture and ill treatment. Uh, Thailand has ratified the UN Convention Against Torture. 
Uh, it's also passed its own national law, the name of which I always forget, which is why I'm going to look at it right now, the uh, Act on Prevention and Suppression of Torture and Enforced Disappearances, which is now national law and would prevent them from being sent back. So, you know, if you can't send them back to China without violating your international human rights treaty obligations, then do the right thing and send them to where they want to go. Let them go. Or, you know, if you want to play something tricky with China, let them escape. I mean, if these folks escape, as we've seen they're prepared to do, they're going to head right for Malaysia. As soon as they get across into Malaysia, there are people in Malaysia who will take care of it, and they will be allowed to go to Turkey or wherever they want to go. Our understanding is that their uh, wives and sisters and daughters and others are all in Turkey. Um, you know, and if they're reunited, that will be the end of it. So, I mean, Thailand should toughen up and say to China, look, you know, according to our law and according to these international human rights standards, we can't send them to you. Full stop. So we're going to do what we need to do, uh, and you're just going to have to take it. That, that's very, really strong. Actually, uh, you just meet the the voice from the son, yes, that is proof that uh, their family members are in Turkey and they're waiting for, for their fathers, the grandfathers who re reunite with the family. So then, yes, yeah. <laughs> okay, so Kun Kanavi, uh, I know you have been advocating for, for their rights even before you became the uh, members of parliament. Then at that time when you host, uh, when you like the, um, with your foundations, like Pete's Right Foundation is co-host of this event as well. But now, as the MP role, do you feel that you have more power and do you have more opportunity to push to make sure to end detentions of these uh, Uyghurs in immigration detentions? Or like, yeah, it, or is there any still obstacle that you not be able to implement like your dream? <laughs> Thank, thank you, Kapi Aircraft. So first and foremost, thank you so much for organizing uh, the talk on Uyghur people who are here, the wireless people who are almost being forgotten for 10 years in detention center. And second of all, sorry that they're coming a little bit late here, just flew from, from Chiang Rai. And so, so to answer your question, I would like to, to share with you the three stories that I have, my personal stories. So Kun Phil, Kun Andreas, Pity already give you a big picture about the situation in Uyghur, about in Xinjiang, what happening over there, the violation of uh, human right, basic human right for Uyghur in, in Xinjiang Autonomous Region. For me, I would like to share with you three stories. The first story is my personal story dealing with the uh, Uyghur. The second one will be for the Peace Right Foundation, and the third one will be as an MP. But you can cut me short anytime. Cut, <laughs> cut. So, first one, you know, on I can remember now, on the 14th of March 2014, around 1 o'clock or 2 o'clock in the morning, I got a call by the, from the, uh, the, the uh, commander of Immigration Division 6 in Songkhla, in Hajai. At the time, I was in Hajai as well, dealing with Rohingya situation. And he called me at 2 o'clock and then asked me to come to the, to the, uh, to the rubber field at 2 o'clock in the morning. He said he found a group of Rohingya who, who didn't look like the Rohingya. He would like me to go there and verify that are they Rohingya or what. So I said, sir, it's two o'clock in the morning. I will not be able to go. So, but I would join you guys at, in the morning, early morning. So in the morning, I went to the immigration division, uh, division six, uh, close by the, the airport, the Hajar airport. I look at the group, more than 200 individuals. They separate the men and also women and children differently in the different location. And I told, I, told, I told the commander that, sir, for sure, they're not Rohingya. But I'm not quite so sure where they're from. So that's uh, the, the first thing that uh, my impression, at that time I was working for UNICEF and as a, uh, the liaison officer for the representative here in Thailand. So we tried by all means to, to identify where they're from. And the first impression was that they, did not, they didn't want to talk to anyone at all. So I tried to put my UNICEF jacket, the blue and white, 
try to let them calm them down that that's not only immigration, not only Thai authority, but also the UN. Aita, they didn't care or did, they didn't know about UNSCR. So I tried my best for almost 10 days, so calling my colleague from other operations around the world and try to ask them to speak through the speakers and to let them, heard, let them hear the, the voice of the people from the other side. So until I reached to the Turkish operation in Turkey, when they start saying something that catch attention from the group of the people, and because we, we can see that, okay, maybe they're from somewhere close to Turkey. So that's how we found out in the first seven days or 10 days. So we communicated directly with the ambassador, the Turkish ambassador here in Thailand. So and then we tried to get the chance to ask him to come here to, the, uh, to, the, to, to, to Hat Yai to talk to the people. And he came with a, an, an, another person. And when that person came together with the team from the Turkish embassy in Thailand to Immigration Division 6, all the group cried. Not all, but many of them cried, especially men. They cried. And now we knew that where they're from. We tried to ask what's happening, where they're from. So later on, we found out that they're from, from Xinjiang, Uyghur. And so that's it's the, the start, the kickstart of the process of the refugee status determination. The Turkish em embassy, they declared that they didn't, they didn't want to do any refugee status determination in Thailand. They can be resettled first. They can go first to Turkey and they can do refugee status determination over there, at which it's awkward. Uh, no, no, it's, a, uh, it's not a normal case. It's like a special case for the Turkish government to allow the group of 200-something people, 219 to be exact, to go f to Turkey and do refugee status determination in Turkey at that time. So we communicated with the uh, Thai immigration and also the Thai police, royal police here in Bangkok, asking them that, OK, if the Turkey gov Turkish government want to resettle all of them, would it be possible to do so? They said, go ahead, that's good. And we, we coordinate everything on the ground. So the Turkish embassy, he called uh, Ankara to ask for permission to resettle these 219 people to go there right away and to charter the flight, one, one airplane to come at that time. So before we get, get the, got the green light, the police, the Royal Thai police here in Bangkok called me again and said, OK, if you guys want to take these 219 people, take another 100 and something in Bangkok. In total, almost 400 people. It means the Turkish government need to charter two flights directly from Ankara to come to Bangkok. And I called the amb ambassador right away. The ambassador said, OK, give me five minutes. Let me call Prime Minister at the time. Prime Minister now is president. They called Prime Minister. Even five minutes, he said, green light, two planes going to depart uh, from Ankara to be in Bangkok within 24 hours. So my heart started boom, boom. So now we can resettle 400 people just really talking on the ground. And the day of the departure of the flight from Ankara, we got the bad news from the Thai government through the uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs that no go. Please don't let the two plane, the charter flight to come from Ankara to come to Thailand. There's no deal any long, anymore. At that time, it's just like spending like a month or two try to deal with this situation. And Don, not not Kun Don, Tovi Chak Chai Kun. So then that is the, the case during that time. And all, later on, all the Uyghur been detained separately in many immigration detention center in the southern Thailand, in many other uh, locations in the northeast, the southeast of Thailand. And so we try to do our best, try to identify a solution. That is uh, my, my first story, because in June 2014, the same year, I went out, I went to South Sudan. And I still continue following the situation. The next year, 2015, I found out, first thing, 179, right, been resettled to, to Turkey. 109, returned, repatriated involuntarily back to China. One of 109 people, the one who I deal with is my friend, was my friend, disappeared. 
not sure what happened. So that was in 2015. And I'm still following up on this situation until 2021 when I resigned from UNICEF, established my own foundation, Peace Rights Foundation. The first advocacy work for me to do is to do for the Uyghur, to identify durable solution for Uyghur. These 50 people at that time that are still fighting, but now two people passed away already. So as a CSO, as an NGO, national NGO, the only way, because I tried my best to find solution, they said the only way, the only group of people that can help you, you go there to the parliament, you talk to the committee, you talk to the subcommittee under the House of Representatives, they can identify some solution for you guys. So we went there, I went there, initially I went to the the Committee on the Legal, Legal Affairs, Justice and Human Rights. They could not identify. I went BPT to the Committee on the International Relations. They couldn't do anything. That's why I decided to become the politician myself. And I'm sitting at the Committee on the Legal Affairs, Justice and Human Rights. And still, we're trying. So, as the MP now, what I have been doing as P PA asked that do we feel more powerful to identify durable solution for the Uyghur. I think I have more spaces to talk, but I'm still powerless again. As long as I'm not the government, I'm not in the government side, as long as I'm in the opposition, in the House of Representatives, I can't speak out loud. But at least public here about what's happening with the group of people who have be almost been forgotten for 10 years and we have no idea how long it's going to take for them to stay there and how many people are going to pass away soon. So, I wish, I'm not, I don't want to say which, I hope this government could hear me today. Now, that is 10 years already, it's 10 years coming on the 14th of March. You have to make decisions quickly. So you cannot, because I understand also the international relation between Thailand and China. This is a big question mark for the Thai government. Either, every government that comes to power, they need to think about this international relation between Thailand and China. But again, I think human beings more than, more important than religion. Many people might not agree with me. Many people said that Relationships between the two countries is much more important. But without human being, country cannot work. Country cannot go. That's why I try to push, push by all means. I also have a chance, just quickly, I have a chance to talk to the Chinese ambassador in Thailand. I asked, frankly, openly, that what do you want from the Uyghur that's been detained in Thailand? He said he just want them to go home. Their home is there. So, so that is his, I think this is a position of, of Chinese government. They want to solve the problem inside their country, so which is for sure all the government, they have a right to provide protection to their own citizens. If those individuals are recognized as a citizen, but not quite so sure the Uyghur had been recognized as a citizen in China or not. But that is the, the way, but I, I try to talk, as, as I said, that I'm not that powerful. When I talk to the ambassador, just only the opposition. I'm not the government just yet. But soon, I believe in the next couple of years, maybe something changed. <laughs> but I can, we cannot wait until for a couple of years to get the Uyghur to be released. One, like me, I, I can, I will do. I said, one, I will do. But if we all together, we can, we can achieve. So these are the three stories that I just would like to share from my own personal stories. Okay, that's very good. Okay, thank you so much. That's very good. I think, I think that's very good information from all of you. Actually, is um, I, I feel like, yeah, I feel good that the Chinese government want to take people back to their home. But I think it's more important that we need to ask them where they want they, where they would like to go, where they identify as a home or the safe place for them. I mean, if like anyone who's not happy, for example, even like 
like Thai people who are not happy to be in Thailand and they want to be listed in other countries, that should be the right. I think everyone in the world should be the right to, to be resettled or to be stay in the place where they feel safe. And actually, we, we are talking a lot about Thailand, a relationship with China's government and blah, blah, blah. But for me, I don't think that like if we think to f if we want to flee like let's say 50 people it's going to be a big deal <laughs> for the Ch uh, in terms of relationship between thailand and china i think there's many more things in terms of relationship that thailand and china having together so why they're so mind on so mean on like for these 50 people i don't think if uh, thai government can have like good decision i i don't think it would be ruined the relationship between Thailand and China. So it just need to just need to be brave and courage. And I wish that I hope that the, they, they will be free before you become the government. No. <laughs> I think like anyway, but yes, uh, I wish you have a yeah, in, in next few years, few years. Um, I'm not sure whether people in here would like to talk first or, or shall we uh, get questions from, from, from the audience and also maybe people on the online also if they have any questions that are on the Facebook or whatever. You, you want to say something before we open the floor? Or, uh, I, I just wanted to say how fascinating it was to hear that about the two planes. And what did the foreign minister say to you about why the deal was off? Did he say that China basically blocked it? Uh, it's just, he, he didn't say anything much. He just said that the deal is off because uh, uh, they didn't have a green light from the prime minister. But we, we knew because I, I didn't want to explain the whole story. Before that deal off, there were a group of the consulate office from a consulate office of Chinese consulate office in Hatyai visited that immigration division six at that time. They took all the photos, even me, myself. They come with the phone and point to my face. They twisted the phone, I twisted, I broke the phone. And at that time, I still remember. That's what we, we realized that soon, there will be the interventions from the Chinese government. And yeah, right away, yeah. No, just, just a clarification, we, we gave crazy dates about the trial, but in fact, uh, the next hearing uh, of the trial of the two Uyghurs who have been accused of the Bangkok bombing in 2015 uh, will take place at the Bangkok South Criminal Court from 26 to 28 March. So those of you who are interested in attending, obviously my organization and others are, are normally monitoring those hearings. I, I would like to share with you that all of them don't want to, they want to prove that they are not China. But however, the information that I, I share with you that uh, from friend in Ministry of Foreign Affairs, they also say that every week, every month, uh, the Chinese will send the document to prove that all of the people in the detention center is from China, from Xinjiang. But all of them throw out the passport uh, document that to prove that they are Chinese, they are from Xinjiang because they don't want to live in Xinjiang and China anymore. They want to resettle in the third country. And then uh, when we asked for the policy for, for Uyghur, do you remember? In uh, Foreign Affairs Committee, they said that no policy for Uyghur. And they said, what is mean, no policy? So it means they will stay here until they die in the jail? No policy, and they said that the, the good place for the Uyghur is to stay here in Thailand, in the IDC, in the jail. That is the decision of the authority of Thailand, and like uh, Kun Gandawi said, the decision is come from the government, is not come from the parliament. Parliament just bring the issue up and talk and discuss and make the public understand, but however, a decision is uh, with the government, and uh, again, uh, the relationship between two countries also make this issue is very difficult. Uh, for us, we also try to make like propose, a, a small propose, uh, like the case of the Uyghur that uh, have uh, health uh, problem in the IDC after two of them passed away. Uh, 
and I think that the National Human Rights Commission visits them and then uh, proposed uh, to have the doctors to go inside and check up the health with them and then their success, no? They allow the doctor to go inside and check up their health. So I think that for us it should be step and step to see that what is reality that we can do. Right now we also try to talk with some authority who, I don't know who that can make decision right now because uh, the politics in Thailand is not certain yet, no? They are in the term of maybe they will be changed a new cabinet in a few months, so I don't know who will be the position for this. But we propose to move them out from the IDC to live in another place. If you don't have any policy for them, they should not stay there in the IDC. Because IDC is the place to keep the people who will go to the third country to, to stay then for the short term, no? It is not, it is not 10 years already and you don't know where to send them. So they should move to stay in another place. But however, to resettle in the third country may be another step, waiting for Hun Kandavi to be a government and then we will propose that. <laughs> Thank you. I, I just want to add something, even though before and we, we are able to become a government. So I just would like to, to, to give, provide you additional information that uh, under the 35 permanent committees of the House of Representatives, two of the committees we are working on the identification of durable solutions for the refugees. So one of which is uh, the one that I'm sitting uh, at the Committee on Legal Affairs, Justice and Human Rights. We established the subcommittee on the identification of durable solutions for on the irregular migrations. So the irregular migration we, we categorize into, into three groups, the refugees, migrant, migrant workers, and stateless people. Also, we extended our co coverage to the victims of the human trafficking as well. So this is the, um, one of the, the improvement uh, under the House of the Representative that we try to identify solutions. So Uyghur will be one of, one, one of which that will be under the refugee sector. So we're going to look at durable solution for the refugees. So we, we try to find. And also another committee is for Kun Rang Siman Rom. And that one we will specify onto the Burmese refugee. Refugee come from Myanmar. So, but however, we can coincide. Yeah, that's a, the more development that, development that we're doing. Come. I think everyone tried hard on this and uh, I think we, we, we kind of seeing like the, the positive steps, but uh, yeah, not yet like to the ultimate uh, goal. Um, I, and also we still have Kun uh, Ratikun today with us here uh, on, uh, on the uh, viewpoint of Digital Human Rights Commissions. If you have any questions and if you, uh, we, we may ask like, uh, one couple of questions to the National Human Rights Commission of Thailand also. But at the moment, I would like to open the floor for the questions. And also, I think like the people uh, monitor the uh, Facebook. And if there is if there is any questions from the Facebook also, please uh, raise. And uh, before that, at downstairs, uh, I think like can, can someone go downstairs and take the books, three books? On, on, on, on Uyghur and we can talk about the book a little bit also. Okay, Ka, any questions? Uh, you can speak Thai or English, no, no worry. We can manage the, in terms of language translations. Mi kam tha mai ka? Okay, Ka, and, uh, and please identify yourself also. But I mean, if, you, if, if anyone don't want to be in the camera, you just let, let us know. We, are, we, we uh, in terms of security concerns, that's no issue. Um, uh, thank you for um, for allowing me to join this session. Um, uh, my name is Nan. I'm from Islam Assist Thailand. I'm from Position Team, and I just uh, need to ask Kun uh, Ganawi about the processing in uh, IDC at Songkra that you. Uh, Mention. I just asking you that uh, have you any problem uh, when you submit the request to enter the IDC and how long that you take time like uh, uh, the IDC uh, uh, like uh, allow you to visit because of 
I think in Bangkok it has many problems when we submit to request to enter and visit our client at IDC. And so uh, I think in uh, separate the part in the south and central and many kind of the province is different. I just asking you because of Uyghur is very important like uh, asylum seeker in Thailand and the government um, like that all of you mentioned, they not treat them like basically depend on human rights. Yes. Uh, uh, any other questions from from here? Maybe we can we get questions first and then yeah. Hi, um, my name is Duke. I'm joining from my for personal capacity. Basically, the question for the NHRCT. Um, it seems like it's so difficult to access the Uyghur in the detention. So I, I think my question is, is there any report or is there any interview from the Human Rights Commission um, with the immigration or with the officer inside to compare the treatment between the Uyghur and other detainee? And also, maybe can you share a bit about collecting information about the detention of the Uyghur? Because we talk a lot here in the panel about arbitrary detention, so I wonder whether the arbitrary detention happens specifically for the Uyghur, also other population, and whether there is any exception or any difference between the two groups. Thank you. Okay. Any more questions? Okay. Yeah. Hi. Um, I, I do, today we talk about like how Thailand is trying to position itself like between China, like, you know, not pro-human rights, and then Western countries pro-human rights. I am wondering, can we go beyond the narrative of human rights when engaging with Thai government and also including the Chinese government as well? Like, can we find a way, I don't know, from maybe from the human, international human rights organization's perspective or, or the politicians, like, can we go beyond this? Like, human rights is American or like Westernized, you know, so that's for me. Okay. Any more questions from here? So I think we, we take three now. Okay. And yeah. So first, for, yeah. for the first question, Kunen. So at that time, 2014, different, different story uh, if you compare between then and now. Because over there, that time, I, we had a deal. I mean, UNSCR, we, we work on the Rohingya situation. So that's why we, the door, all the doors are open, were open for us to visit all the IDC. So we have Rohingya, we have Uyghur, and we also supported the immigration at that time. So that's why they welcome us to go. But now, as we speak now, I think different story. I think even the committee we try, I mean, Committee on Legal Affairs, Justice and Human Rights, we talked to the immigration, we went to see the commander of the immig Immigration Bureau and asking that maybe we can be able to visit the Uyghur in the detention center. I said, no, just really taking photo, taking video and show with us, share with us. But I think in the personal level, there might be some, some possibility. So for that is my response that for NHRC, I will ask you later. But on the, the last question, go beyond the human rights, so let me respond first, quickly, just only because I cannot go beyond human rights, because they are here. So for, uh, for me, I look at uh, the situation of Uyghur in a different angle now, because I look, first I look on the humanitarian perspective, second I look at the human rights, and third I look at the politician. I think that if we're still stuck into our our paradigm, paradigm about uh, the idea of Uyghur, about this relationship between Thailand and China, I think we could not go anywhere. We're going to go beyond the thing that we have to identify solution. What I would like to say is that this is our th this Thailand, our sovereignty. So I always say that it's so. If the Thai government has a gut to say that this is my country, we're going to identify solution in my own country. No one can penetrate into my sovereignty. So that can go beyond. However, I'm not quite so sure that the current government has a gut to do so. And, but if uh, it were me, I would just push that, that these are the durable solutions for refugees inside Thailand. We recognize that refugees are here. So we identify solo solution by ourselves. No one can tell us. This is what we're going to do. But we have, and also we have justifications in terms of human rights and humanitarian as well. Over to you. Yeah. Um, 
I would say, I mean, frankly, um, I don't care how they get loose. I don't care how they get where they want to go. <clears throat> I mean, if you want to talk about a human rights argument, if you want to talk about a humanitarian argument, I mean, the humanitarian argument is family reunification. I mean, these people have been basically separated from their families for 10 years. So if you want to argue that that is okay, that's, that's the way to go, you know, appeal to Thai policymakers, like, you know, think about the wives and the children of these men who have been without their uh, loved one for all these years. If that works, fine. I mean, but, you know, Human Rights Watch is, um, you know, we're, we're very pragmatic about this kind of stuff. We want, it, we want the, the outcome that respects rights. Um, I mean, I do take issue with, I mean, human rights is not a Western concept. It's a, it's a universal concept. Um, and, you know, I constantly have to bat down that idea that somehow this is a Western concept because this is what, it's like the hangover from Asian values from Mahathir and Lee Kuan Yew all those years ago that, you know, people somehow think this is Western. It's not. It's universal. Um, I think that the big problem in terms of what, what's going on with the Uyghurs is that there is a deliberate policy by Thai uh, immigration and policymakers to isolate them. They don't want the lawyers getting in there. They don't want the relatives getting in there. I mean, I'm, I'm surprised the NHRCT was able to go. I'm glad they were able to see them. But, I mean, you know, there is a, a deliberate effort to keep them a, separate and away from everybody else. Um, and that is being done as a deliberate policy. And, you know, I think the argument maybe is that they're a national security risk or somehow that it's about China or whatever it is. But we have to, it, at least in the initial part, we have to break down that isolation of these people in detention so that we can get not just only halal food for them, but also issues like, for instance, legal representation. I mean, I think what, we, what we've heard now is that, um, you know, if they, if they thought it would help them, that they would be prepared to uh, appeal to UNHCR and admit that they're Uyghur in fact, that they want to be sent to a third country, um, which they didn't do at the beginning, as I was mentioning. So, so you know, I mean, I think that we, the, the, the thing we have to do is that we have to break down that isolation that they're currently facing. And maybe part of that is uh, better health care, you know, so that they have an opportunity not only to have health care in the prison, but also to go out and have health care outside the immigration detention. Um, uh, and if they escape while they're doing that, I don't mind. <laughs> we are not as pragmatic as Human Rights Watch. We're more, much more principled, but <laughs> but I, yeah, I, I think in fact we're we're not asking um, extraordinary things from the Thai government. We're asking for the bare minimum and the respect of um, and compliance with obligations under international human rights law. That that. that um, that are not so difficult. In fact, um, for instance, detention conditions have been have been mentioned quite a few times. Uh, we do a lot of work on monitoring of prison conditions. We would like to do more work on monitoring conditions in immigration detention centers, but unfortunately, as you've heard, uh, very few uh, individuals, if not organizations, have access to immigration detention centers. Uh, but in fact, um, there is, uh, uh, international standards related to, to prison conditions are called the standard minimum rules for the treatment of prisoners. So it's not excellencies. It's not that, that uh, we expect detainees or prisoners to be housed at the Hilton or, or uh, uh, a four or five star hotel. This is the, the normal, but this is the standard minimum rule. So it's much lower than, than what, what could be expected. And Thailand doesn't even meet those minimum uh, standards. So and we're not asking for too much. This year, Thailand will be uh, a candidate for um, a seat uh, on the UN Human Rights Council for the, the term from 2025 to 2027. Uh, elections are likely to be September, October. But um, we expect that at least on certain issues that shouldn't be too uh, political or sensitive, like for instance, the treatment of, of uh, detainees in immigration detention centers and, and prisons, 
um, are actually respected are among the pledges that the Thai government will make to the international community. And not just pledging, but also follow up and implement those pledges. Okay, uh, because there's a question uh, for yeah, Kun Latakun also. Yeah. Okay, uh, can Kun Latakun, can you come here? I think that, I think, yeah, please come here because uh, it's on, it's a live oh, stream also. Is that okay? From the, yeah, yeah better, better to come here, please. Maybe okay. one, one chair, can you? Yeah. Oh. Uh, okay. Okay. okay. For that question, I think that everybody knows that it's, it's not easy to talk with the, with the Immigration Bureau, even though the NHRCT is the independent organization and we have uh, the organic law give us some, not power, but the authority to do something. Even that, we have to talk with them like times and again, not just only one time that you request to go and then you will get the permission to go inside. We have to, to talk so many times, we have to write the letter, we have to find a way to talk to the higher authorities on this matter. But finally, we can, we can go, but we, frankly speaking, we didn't have chance to talk with the Uyghur themselves. They still say that it's a highest uh, security matters, but they, uh, I, but I can say that their response is much better than four or five years ago, that they don't want to talk about this anymore. Uh, any, uh, but this time they can give us more information and for the case of the, of the two uh, that that just died recently, they gave us, uh, they're quite cooperative when, they, when, they, when we do the investigation. We can talk to so many people in the, in the, in the detention center. This is the, I'm not quite sure whether we, I answer your question clearly uh, for, for, for this uh, first part of the question. And I'm so sorry, for the second part is, I think that for the indefinite uh, period of detention, it might be for the Uyghur and also some for Rohingya as well, because uh, for Rohingya, they also faced the same face that no one would like to recognize them as their own citizen. It's still difficult. Even the lady, she doesn't want Rohingya back to Burma herself, right? Okay, for, for this, I think that for, for Uyghur and Rohingya, they face the same situation. And it's, uh, when we talk about the indefinite uh, period of time for the authority concern, they cannot say anything. If, I think that is like up to the policy of the government as lots of uh, panelists here already mentioned. Uh, I think that it's, it's about the policy of each government. But you see, as a, as a Thai citizen, I'm quite disappointed. Okay, when, I think that for when this happened is 2014, right? Yeah. It's just some months before the coup, if I'm not wrong. Right, it's 2014, it's to yeah. 2,000, we have the coup in Song Pan Haroi Hasipjet in May, but uh, this incident happened in March. But I know that during that time, I was with the ministry. I'm, I, I was still in the ministry, but luckily or not, I, I, I didn't have to handle this matter. <laughs> That's 
But I, I remember the incident that uh, Kunkarawi just mentioned. We, the ministry already prepared everything with the, uh, with the police and also with the Turkish ambassador for the, for, uh, to send back this EU. But last minute, they cannot go because uh, some mystery call somewhere that you have to stop this, uh, this operation. Yeah, it's, it, it can happen. And so it means that it's still up to the policy of the government, even though at that time I remember that the Ministry of Foreign Affairs also support this, uh, this, this kind of a solution to send them back to, to Turkey. And I remember that the, ambassador, uh, the Turkish ambassador at that time He's very, he's very eager and he's very active on, on this matter to, to help the, these, uh, these people to go to, go to Turkey. Yeah, and uh, I'm, I would like to come back to my disappointment. When, uh, okay, we, we were under that government for many years and then we have the, new, we have the election, we have the new government, and I thought that this new government we'll have more liberal policy or more balanced policy on this matter or even on human rights, uh, human rights issue in general, not just only for the Uyghur uh, issue, but in general. But it's very disappointing. I never heard anything that they will uphold or uh, what they call the entry, the, the human rights issue in Thailand. And you know what, I would like to uh, give the homework to Kun Kanavi as the member of the parliament. You should tell the government that now Thailand, we would like to have lots of FTA negotiation with, e with the EU with the EFTA country, and these countries, they pay, they, they, they pay very but high uh, importance to the, to the human rights elements as well. I don't think that just only going there, tell them, telling them that Thailand, uh, the economic situation in Thailand is very good, we have a very good uh, infrastructure, we have a very good, uh, we have a very skilled workers and blah, blah, blah, blah. But they never mention about other elements. They never mention about our, our judicial system, which everybody knows that, I don't know, we, maybe we don't have the judicial system here, <laughs> the justice <laughs> here in Thailand. So I think that this element, the government should, should mention or should should do something to improve in, uh, for, for, for as uh, we already vote, even though I, I don't vote for them, but okay, <laughs> at least they are the government now. And I, I would like Kun Kalavi to, maybe you can uh, whisper to, the, to, to <laughs> someone who are, who, are, who are very close to the prime minister or to, the, to someone who, who, what, who uh, dom not dominate, but what you got, manipulate <laughs> all, manipulate all the policies that we have to follow them at the moment. Okay, okay thank you. Is, yeah, that's uh, important. Uh, basically, I, I know that what you're meaning, you're meaning, you are meaning that don't, don't be, don't don't try to be only sale man, right? You have to know. I a lot more. the prime minister is a sale man. <laughs> Quickly, in, in fact, you know, I, I'm not surprised that why this government is doing the same thing because at that time, 2014, was Kun Ying Rak was the prime minister, uh, and the yeah, deal was of. It's quite very. Uh, with, it's just very last, uh, uh, a yeah, couple of last months. months, yeah. But uh, the months. month that the the deal was off because of Kun Ying Rak still in power, uh, and uh, yeah, still in power at that time. Yep. Which, uh, which month is that? March. March. March. Okay. March, the end of March. Because the coup is yeah. in yeah. May. Right, yeah. right, exactly. Yeah. And also about, about the homework that you, give, uh, that you gave to me, I already ah. whispering, I already <laughs> shouted in the house, in the House of Representatives, bilaterally, 
every time. And last time that I asked, requested the Deputy Prime Minister, Minister of Foreign Affairs to come to answer the question simultaneously, he ran away. So that's why on the, on the, on the first week of April, he cannot run away anymore if the, the camera is here. So he will not run away anymore because we are going to use the, the Article 152 to ask, to request, to talk to the government, to ask them to answer all the questions. So this time will be a good opportunity for the government to answer all the questions. Mm -hmm. And all the human rights situation, humanitarian, business and human rights such and such will be asked. So I will try my best not to talk to people who can manipulate them and try to talk to them in a nicer way to make them understand more about the 21st century situation. Oh, yes, thank you. Uh, uh, may I have uh, one, one, one, one, one thing to, to that There's also a question here and there. Like one, more. Okay. Uh, one thing that I would like to share with all the panelists and, uh, and the people who are in this, in this room is about uh, the screening mechanism that I mentioned. Yes. I think that they already start uh, implement this. And uh, our office have uh, has talked with the with the with the police and also with the Ministry of uh, Interior, and we try we ask them to include this uh, like the Uyghur to be in this uh, in this category, so they will not be kept in the detention. But uh, they said that okay they. Uh, the way the response is, is, is not so negative. They say that, okay, since uh, this mechanism just start implementing, let's see whether like, maybe after some months or maybe a year, they will do the revision. And we, I still have hope that they, they might have some revision and include uh, these uh, these people to be in in these categories, mm -hmm. and if Kun Kanrevi can voice this to someone, I think that it might help. Thank you. Yeah, that would that would be a good solution. I was just going to say very quickly that um, we also are very disappointed with this government in terms of what it's doing on human rights. Um, you know, I mean, basically every time we talk about human rights, they come back and say talk about LGBT rights. Mm -hmm like that they're going to pass that one bill and that will be all their human rights progress. So you have things like, you know, ongoing slap suits and criminal defamation. You have cases of uh, people still being char charged and prosecuted for the emergency decree, even though the emergency decree was lifted. You have, uh, I mean, we wrote a long letter to uh, Prime Minister Zeta, you know, outlining a bunch of recommendations and asking a bunch of questions. Of course, no response. Um, you know, I mean, it's pretty clear that this government has deprioritized human rights. That's the problem. They basically have got everything else on their mind. And, and I'm hoping, I mean, that's what we're looking at. We're looking at things like the EU tie FTA to try to create the leverage to force the government to look at human rights issues, like reforming the labor law or, uh, you know, treating migrant workers better or recognizing refugees and not, you know, sending them back into harm's way. You, you know, the, the, we, had, we had these cases of um, a number of the refugees, uh, six who were arrested uh, from Cambodia uh, when Hun Manet came. And we had a big fight with the, with the government to finally get the government to say, okay, well, we won't send them back. Now they're coming to us and say, see, what, we're so much better than the military government, we didn't send them back. And I'm like, well, you shouldn't have arrested them in the first place. <laughs> the same thing with the Russian rock band. The Russian rock band, that was touch and go for a bit. You know, they were talking about sending back to Russia, and then they finally realized it would make it look bad for their global salesman thing, that if in, the Europeans and the Americans were angry at them, they wouldn't invest. So, I mean, you know, we're, we're almost in the point where we have to sort of do workarounds uh, connected to investment and economic growth to try to get them to think about human rights, because otherwise they, they're just like thinking about one thing only, tourism, investment, business. I mean, um, I, I, the question that they, they uh, respond on the third question, I know that this, this year, no, Thailand maybe will be the member of National Human Rights Council on the UN, and I know that they got the number of the vote already 
so they will win. Yeah. <laughs> that is, I know they, they got already, they got already the, the number. Yeah. <laughs> enough, enough for, for them to yeah. sit there as a member. And next year, it will be the UPR review uh, cycle again. Uh, as you, your question, because, uh, and we also discussed about the situation and also policy and also uh, politic, you know, political relationship. Uh, another thing that we can do because we can, and also many friends also try with international standard, international law. Another thing that we should do about the people movement and the people uh, to raise this issue up and also share their perspective, their uh, report writing on UPR next year that I also uh, would like to convince everyone to be part of the UPR report Thailand to write the report, submit to the council. Thailand sit there as a council. I don't know if she will get, she will get the chairperson again or not. Like at the time, Ab Khun Siyasak Mong Ket Ka will sit there as a chairperson. I'm not so sure for this time. Maybe possible again to be a, a chairperson. And then it will be good if we also put the report, the UPR report there, and also mentions many of the violation, human rights violation in the country with the ethnic group and uh, blah, blah, blah. So that I think that that is another hope that we should do. No? So for Thai people, maybe they don't know how to use the UN mechanism uh, to do the, for advocacy. I think that this is a time for us to do that. PF also write the other report to search committee. And the search committee is very good uh, last two years. No? And they also asked about the Ugu. Thai, Thai delegation cannot answer this question. And then the, delega uh, the committee said that we hope that in the next uh, cycle of the report, Thai government will re re uh, answer this question. I cannot remember the question, but however, some things about the Uyghur in Thailand. So this kind of the mechanism that we, did, we didn't use that. And it should be used by the people, by the, the NGOs, no? because sometimes we waiting we cannot hope with the government, with the others, you know, but they are another channel that we can do. So I convene everyone to follow up about UPR report next year. That will be the another cycle to report of Thailand. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I think that's all good. I think we can have another talks on like uh, Thai government and human rights. <laughs> that, that, that, that's a lot, and I know that. Uh, because the time runs so fast now, we almost like two hours, like surprisingly, because our information is very interesting. But we, I think we still have one question from, uh, from the Facebook and one question uh, from here. Uh, I think, uh, is that okay? I think we can take like maybe another five minutes to handle these two questions. So then, like, yeah. The, this uh, question from, from the Facebook, why is move forward parties not interested in Uyghur issues the same way as Rohingya issue? I mean, there's no move forward party here, so then I don't think whether we have authority to say it or not. But anyway, <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> I mean, people confuse that <laughs> you are not for move forward. But okay, let let get uh, questions from from from here uh, from you, and and see like how do and how do we answer this uh, question. Can you put uh, the microphone? Uh, I'm Jacob Goldberg. I'm a reporter at The New Humanitarian. Um, I imagine that if Thailand is susceptible to pressure from China, then maybe UNHCR would also be susceptible to pressure from China. Uh, the member of parliament, you worked for, at UNHCR until 2021, you said, from uh, from your experience there, what did you see as UNHCR's, what were the tools at, at the agency's disposal, disposal? And did the agency exhaust those tools? And if not, why not? Okay, these two questions. Uh, um. okay, no, that, that, that, the, last, the last question. Okay, now my head is not UNHCR any longer. <laughs> However, I can say that you, you we have to understand the UN system as well. So the United Nations Agency, when, wherever they are operating, they have to be invited to get into their country. So that, that's why there's, there are some limitations in terms of the 
policy, policy, the approval and permission, such and such. So, like for example, this uh, Myanmar refugee in the night camps, temporary shelters. So, you know, I have only one duty is coordinating. It's a co for only the coordination, not service providers. So, because some restriction, according to the agreement, since the invitation had been extended to UNICEF, so there's some limitation as well. So, if you ask, if I can answer that, has UNICEF exhausted all the tools or the mechanisms that they have? I believe that they do. However, the tools that allow them, uh, that that available for them in each operation are different. So, in country like Thailand, we have different tools. In Myanmar, we have different. We have no tools at all. And in, in Sudan, South Sudan, Uganda, we might have different kind of tools. So that's why I think that working for UN is still, is, I can say, it's quite bureaucratic. So it's like government somehow. So we have to get approval. We need to run after them, ask for their permission. So without their permission, without their willing, without their blessing, we cannot achieve anything. So that is the, my quick answer. Was there a formal request? Yeah, yes, yes, for sure. Indeed, indeed. When was the last one? The last one I didn't know because when I, I left that I left the operation Thai operation in 2014, and I've been around and. Yeah. Well, I mean, but what is quite clear is also that UNHCR did publicly state their. Uh, well, they they they they brought out a statement when 109 were sent back stating very clearly that that was a case of reformo. Um, and they have been pretty vocal about the group. <clears throat> um, I mean, I think, um, you know, part of, part of the difficulty is what I was mentioning at the beginning was that, that the, originally the group didn't formally ask for UNHCR to be involved because they were maintaining the fiction that they were Turkish in order to push the Chinese consulate and the Chinese diplomatic officials away. Um, you know, it would be very interesting to see what happened if, for instance, UNHCR was granted access now. And, you know, whether, in fact, the Uyghurs would ask for uh, asylum and also whether the Thai government would uh, allow them to move forward with that. Because if, if, in fact, they were determined to be refugees through this process, that could be a potential game changer because it changes the dynamic. It says, okay, you can't send them back to China because they're refugees. Which is, I think, precisely why China and Thailand government are trying to keep UNHCR out. Because if you change the status of these people, then it, then it becomes that, okay, you have to send them to a third country because you can't send them back to China. Okay. Yeah, and I on the, I don't know why the Move Forward Party doesn't. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, in fact, I cannot, I, I cannot speak on behalf of Move Forward Party, but I have heard they're interested, but I will, I will convey the message to Move Forward Party <laughs> that why you're not interested in Uyghur situation, but I believe that they, they are interested. So, I remember when, the, when, the, when Rome, Rang Man Rome is a chairperson, before election, we met with him and submit the letter and he received the letter and invited us to meet with the uh, Foreign Affairs Committee. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I think that I, I passed the questions to Kun Kanawi, you know, and Kun Kanawi will work further you know, with move forward parties on this, okay. Uh, but we cannot answer on behalf of them. Uh, I think it's, it's come to the final. Uh, I'm not sure, maybe, I'm not sure anyone in the panel do you want to have the final word? Final word, final word. <laughs> okay, if not, um, there are uh, small things. Now we have two books uh, translated by Netiwit. Netiwit, he is the formal uh, student activist and he's still like, he's not the student now, but he's still really active. So he translated two, two books on about Uyghurs. The first one is Kwam Thuk Kong Chao Uyghu, Pai Tai Communist Jin. Naka they here, uh -huh. and the uh, uh, second edition is already. The second one is the, yeah, thank you. Kai Narok Nai Sinjiang Uigu. No, if you if you want to, if you want to to buy like some more some more book. If if you want to buy, uh, we we we sell the book for them uh, downstairs. If you, I think that would be really good information on the Uyghur. And uh, before I, oh, I'm I'm thinking. 
<laughs> Thank you, every, every, everyone, panelists here, for really good information. Before the last, I would like to invite Kun uh, Kun Kaitun, the directors of Peace Rights Foundations. Uh, for Peace Rights Foundations have been doing other activities uh, in. Uh, uh, can, can, uh, Peace Rights Foundations, Kun uh, Kitapon, uh, will announce the campaign. Uh, like for, for this year because we will have like couple of activities to campaign because we wish that this year there will be the solutions uh, for Uyghurs in detention. Okay, Ka. Thank you, Ka. So my name is Tukeda Pon Simpson Thad, the uh, program director of Peace Rights Foundation, the co-host for tonight's panel discussion. So before the end of this evening, so I would like to ask you to join our call to action for the government. Under the, lead, under the leading of uh, Mr. Setha Tawisit to apply the recommendation of uh, NHRCET made by uh, last October, so to identify the durable solution and stop uh, the indefinite detention right now. So we together, hopefully, I would like to ask you all, invite you all to the House of the Parliament this Thursday, 9 a.m. Please save the date if you are available. We will go to the House of uh, Representatives to file our open letter together. So we will, use, we will continue to use the um, mechanism in the parliament. So we will file our open letter to the commit, uh, parliament, parliamentary committee, uh, three co uh, committee. So first one, it will be the uh, legal affairs, justice, and human rights. And the second one will be committee on uh, foreign affairs, and also the committee on national security, border affairs, national strategy, and national reform, and national, uh, yeah. This one, this three uh, committee, we will uh, hand our let letter, hopefully, to the chair, which is some Two, our the three committee is is the um, government party. <laughs> so, for to be our voice to the Thai government to take action to and stop this inhuman treatment toward the persecuted population. <coughs> so we will be submitting all together to show the government that we, the civil society, the independent organization, the international organization. The world is watching you. We are keeping <coughs> eye on you. So if you free, please come. But if you cannot, you can um, join in this petition by standing this QR and sign your name in our letter. So the letter, full version of letter is in the, in the website, in the link. So yeah, so this is the very least that we can do, but yet it's so important as we are here our stance that this fight must, must end right now. So yeah, thank you, ha. 9 a.m. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, uh, everyone, and uh, for like the uh, the panelists who like have precious experience, knowledge, and and more important is the heart and commitment. To, to help these people and also the audience here and online who who are interested and to hear that um, I think we are also grateful because a couple of you have said that Uyghur is kind of like f forgotten, forgotten population so then we, we have to make sure that they are unforgotten so this is one of more activities and uh, thank you all that for you to stay that late uh, to, to find the solutions and, and, and, and have a safe journal, home, rest, and have a good night, everyone. Goodbye, and thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.